morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Kroger. It is miserable weather outside, but boy, we have a really fun conversation for you on tap here today, looking at some interesting comments from Kirby Smart, a recap of the NFL scouting combine, some of the former dogs on hand there are really saying some pretty cool things, and in some cases, some funny stuff about Georgia. We're excited about the Diamond Dogs this weekend, getting ready to do battle against Georgia Tech. That's always a pretty big deal. Uh, a lot of recruiting talk with Jeff Sintel. That's, uh, I think, important to do on a Friday. We'll look forward to doing that. And in addition to that, y'all, the stuff that's out there right now with the college football playoff, is. am I the only one? I, obviously, I'm not. It seems like I'm hearing from a lot of you, too. It seems like all of the stuff we keep hearing about proposed changes, they just keep getting worse, and almost everybody seems to agree with that. So, We have some thoughts on that today, as you might imagine, and we'll just keep it rolling all day long, and we are so happy to have you with us, Ford, as we do. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Kroger, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Kroger, fresh for everyone. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. One of my favorite things about football is is that it kind of demonstrates just sort of natural success principles that the thing that makes you successful in, like, say, college football is also the kind of thing that can kind of translate to other areas of life there as well. And one of the things that you notice is why is Georgia able to have the success that it's been able to have? Because Georgia seems able to do what other programs cannot do. There's always going to be value in scarcity. Having a lot of what other people can't find enough of is always going to be a really valuable commodity. And being able to do what other people find hard, once again, there's a lot of value in that. That when you're not you know, competing in a very crowded lane, all of a sudden you kind of have a chance to have a little bit more outsized success come your way. You can sort of hoard more victories and more of the spoils of victory, and that is really what Georgia football is all about. Georgia has seemingly a lot of what other programs don't have enough of, and Georgia gets that talent because it's able to do what other programs just find really very hard. And a lot of times it's as simple as that. Like the actual truth shouldn't require an hour to explain, that Georgia is just really good at getting more of something than the average program can get and the pathway by which they acquire that they're just more capable in that regard than the other programs are now what is this thing that i'm talking about well yesterday kirby smart made an appearance on you know josh pate the show from 24 7 sports he was with uh josh on there and kirby as he was kind of foreshadowing and looking ahead to spring practice in the middle of that discussion laid it out in no uncertain terms about what matters to Kirby during spring practice and what matters for Kirby all of the time. It is the thing that makes Georgia different than virtually every team that it competes with. It's only a small number of words, but it tells the entire story of everything that matters with Georgia football. This is Kirby from yesterday. Depth. Depth at all positions. Like, like, can we create offensive and defensive line depth? So when I look across football, the game's changing. Less big guys are playing. There's less. I mean, every NFL scout that comes in here says, we can't find offensive linemen. We can't find offensive linemen. Well, that's what we do here. We recruit offensive linemen. We get big guys, and we develop them. Defensive linemen, there's just less of them. There's less big people. So we want to establish depth at both those positions, and we've got a lot of young guys in here at those two positions. If you could understand – and most of you do, but if you could really, we all even if we think we understand it, like leaning more into that, if we could really ponder the value of that statement as 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 deeply and as necessary as it is, I just think we'd have a better understanding about Georgia football. I think we'd have a better understanding about college football overall. That the thing that actually matters most probably gets less attention than it should, and things that get more attention arguably do not matter as much sometimes as the attention they get. Kirby Smart was asked, hey, what's on your mind ahead of spring practice? He says depth, depth at all positions, but pretty quickly he pivots to more and better offensive and defensive linemen, making sure we have those guys in the program, making sure we're getting those guys ready to play, and making sure we're we're deploying those guys on college football Saturdays. That the secret to Georgia's success actually isn't much of a secret. It is having – a larger collection of capable, ready, offensive and defensive linemen than the other programs that Georgia's competing alongside of. That that is what separates Georgia. Kirby saying, 
NFL scouts come to us. They say we can't find offensive linemen. Well, you can find them here at Georgia. And, y'all, we have been saying this, that when you look at even compared to other, like, championship-level teams or even compared to what we think of as other SEC rivals to UGA, the way in which those teams are having to go deep into the transfer portal and pull, you know, starting offensive linemen from, like, FIU or wherever else. You know, Ohio State went to Oklahoma State, not exactly a power program. Uh, to find a starting offensive lineman, that 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 there is a certain level of desperation that other programs play with when it comes to finding offensive linemen. In a place like Georgia, that's not the case. And this also sort of circles back to what we've talked about the uh, you know the the last couple of days around here, which is hey, in 2023, for whatever reason, seemingly Georgia took a little bit of a step back on its defensive line. That in 2021, maybe the best defensive line of all time, at least among the the conversation. In 2022, dominant once again. Jalen Carter played a big role in all of that. In 2023, kind of a step back in terms of rush defense, not quite getting the quarterback, not quite producing tackles for loss. There was a little bit of a step back for the defensive line. We've been saying the last couple of days that we feel like is the biggest need for Georgia over the course of uh, the spring practice and heading toward the start of the 2024 season is making sure you can kind of get that defensive line at UGA to sort of feeling like a Georgia defensive line once again. And when you hear Kirby Smart there in the short clip we just played, talk about the need for the as many good offensive and defensive line as you can get, I think that only reinforces the point we've been making the last couple of days here is that that is the position that matters. Uh, and, and that is the question that needs answering for Georgia as you head towards the start of the upcoming season. Now, let me do a couple of things with this kind of general topic here for a moment. Let me start with this. I think that if you're a Georgia fan and you kind of buy into this, boy, this really matters. You want to be great on those lines of scrimmage. You want to be far better than everybody else. You want to have a larger number of capable players on both sides of the ball. I think you have some reason to feel pretty good about Georgia starting the work towards making sure that's once again true for 2024 as we're kind of right here at the – on set before spring practice begins. We're already hearing some buzz around a couple of Georgia offensive linemen, for instance. I saw it was kind of fun on a pro football focus the other day, and as we always kind of caveat, PFF is not everybody's cup of tea. I certainly understand that. But they were kind of ranking their top 10 interior offensive linemen in college football. And you just heard Kirby Smart say, man, you got to have the best lines. You've got to have the best offensive linemen, best defensive linemen. NFL scouts say they can't find enough offensive linemen. Once again, Georgia would seem well positioned to have one of the very best, if not the very best, offensive line in the entire sport. I'll show you this. Tate Ratledge comes in, according to Pro Football Focus, as their number two interior offensive line of the upcoming season. Uh, they say that Ratledge, the top guard on the list, dominant pass blocking. They give you all the uh, stats there on that. Uh, his excellence in pass protection extends back to 2022. His first year as a starter, he ranked fourth with his pass blocking grade. Uh, and then uh, his, uh, and then in second in pass blocking grade and true uh, pass sets. Some of this stuff ends up being sort of gobbledygook to me. I don't understand all their stats. But the bottom line is they say Rattledge is our number two uh, interior offensive lineman in college football. We can all understand that, and that's a great building block for an offensive line that no longer has Marius Mims, no longer has Cedric Von Prine Granger, to start with one of the very best guards, one of the very best interior offensive linemen in the sport, is a great way to put an elite offensive line together for the upcoming season, even if that includes some new faces and some new places when it comes to some of those other starting spots. But wait, that's not all, because it's not just Ratledge who's getting some love there from pro football focus. How about the guy that we think could line up opposite him at the other guard spot? Dylan Fairchild also cracks the top ten there as well. And what pro football focus says here is that Georgia and Alabama are the only schools with multiple interior offensive linemen gracing this list. And so while it's debatable which guard duo is better than the two, what's not arguable is that the best pass blocking guard tandem resides in Athens. So there you go for Carson Beck going into his final season. We just gave you some fancy stat type numbers for why Tate Rattledge is so good. They give you another bunch of those for Dylan Fairchild there as well, one of the top interior offensive linemen in the sport. So if you want to start getting optimistic and excited about Georgia for the upcoming season, all the attention, of course, that Carson Beck's going to get and the discussion about who are his new playmakers, the need to replace Brock Bowers, all of that matters. But the fact that once again it appears that Georgia is going to be lining up with an elite offensive line for Carson Beck to play behind, if you listen to Kirby Smart, you might be led to believe that might matter more than anything else. Which sort of brings me to the final point I want to make on this just for a moment. So I think that 
we're about to move into a little bit of a new era as it relates to NIL, name, image, likeness, the current way in which football players are being compensated. Now, we may see more changes coming to all this in the future, but for now, let's assume for a moment that all of this just sort of stays the way, at least formatically, that it kind of is right now. We have been in kind of the raise money phase. You know, how can money be, uh, uh, you know, uh, how, can you, how can you acquire donations? We've been kind of in that phase as it relates to NIL and different programs have had different levels of success. But I believe one way or another, whether you're one of the top NIL programs in terms of the money you can rake in or whether you're somewhere towards the middle, I believe we're about to move past the money acquisition phrase and we're going to talk a lot more about how money is allocated. In other words, at a certain point, you've kind of raised all the money you can raise, and now it's going to be up to some decision maker, given the way in which the NCAA has been treated in court recently. The full charade may be down, and coaches themselves may actually be able to have the full power on determining all of this, you know, without having to pretend like they're not affiliated with the NIL collectives and things like that. But one way or another, we're about to have – a decision to be made of now that we've raised all the money we're capable of raising, how are we going to accolade that money? Uh, allocate, allocates the word I'm looking for. <laughs> you never know what's going to come out of my mouth. How's that money going to be allocated? How's that money going to be sort of spread around? And I think if you're Georgia, I think that's one of those things you ought to hear, think about that, you know, for all the attention of, well, how come Georgia can't get five star wide receivers, for instance? That's a, that's a phrase we hear. How come Georgia can't get five star wide receivers? The truth is, Georgia's scoring about 40 points per game, one of only two teams the last two years to score 40 points per game in each of the last two seasons, even without getting the so-called five-star wide receivers. Now, why is that? I would suggest one of the reasons why Georgia's been able to maintain the consistency that it's shown on offense is because no matter who's lining up at wide receiver, they've been playing behind a great offensive line. That To put this in sort of simple terms, if you had your choice, I think you'd rather have good receivers playing with a great offensive line than the opposite. A great receiver who was playing with an offensive line that wasn't quite up to that same great standard. It may be the same thing at quarterback, too, where we believe that Carson Beck is also uh, a great quarterback, but you might be okay with good quarterback as long as that good quarterback is playing behind a great offensive line. Because to hear Kirby Smart say it and to hear the way that NFL draft scouts are saying it to him, it actually may be easier in the sort of offensive explosion that college football has been over the last 15 years or so. It actually may be easier to find a quarterback that looks great than it is to find an offensive line that looks great. And it may be easier to find wide receivers that look great compared to offensive lines that look great. That might actually be the more scarce thing. And so, therefore, if you're a Georgia booster or if you're you know Georgia from a strategic standpoint, where are you pumping your dollars in the future? I'd say lines of scrimmage are a pretty important place defensive line there too we said this before I've asked Jeff Sintel this question directly many times of if defensive line the very best linemen are becoming the kind of thing that are commanding you know big NIL dollars what would the plan be for for getting those players if you're not going to play the NIL game at the highest level and it's a fair question worth asking but when you hear Kirby Smart saying what he's saying there about hey our offensive and defensive line depth our ability to kind of bring great line of scrimmage players in this program and get them better while they're here. That's the thing that separates us from everybody else. I think in terms of how Georgia kind of positions itself for its NIL future, that's the thing that's got to matter there as well of maybe more so than other positions, making sure you stay great on the offensive and defensive lines. That may be the prime directive for Georgia as a program and every booster who wants to support Georgia as a program. Quarterbacks will get the attention. Wide receivers generate the chatter. You know, some of the stuff, you know, uh, uh, sometimes it's cornerbacks, whatever else on, you know, defense that seem to get a lot of buzz during draft time. But nothing matters more than being great on the lines of scrimmage. Georgia's won two national championships, I would say, in large measure because of how good it was on its lines of scrimmage. And when you look to see how Georgia can be positioned for success in the future, being great on both your offensive and defensive line, I think you can pretty safely say that nothing may be more important than that. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We're presented today by Kroger, and we are happy to have you with us, no matter how you get to us today, live on video across all platforms at 10 a.m. 
Radio, Athens Sports Radio, 960 The Ref, podcasts, wherever you find them, including the worldfamousdognation.com. We are just really happy to have you as a part of our program here today, and we are so thankful for our friends at Kroger who make it all possible. You know, one of the things I think about a lot is how many of the people that are, you know, companies that appear here with us on Dog Nation Daily have just been with us for years. I'm talking about just years and years and years, and Kroger is certainly one of those longtime friends of ours here. And I want to make you aware of something that Kroger also wants to do, because the reason why Kroger shows up on Dog Nation Daily each week is because they want to make you aware of some cool things they have going on for you uh, and ways you can save money, save time, things like that. And so how about this? Uh, as you're moving towards like a busy travel season, a lot of folks got spring break coming up. You know, my family, we've been talking about all the different travel things we're going to be doing over the course of the next few months. Was well, you're thinking about your own travel, travel, going to see your kids play spring sports, things like that. You can save on fuel every time you shop at your local Kroger when you use your Kroger Shoppers card. So make sure you use this. You can earn one fuel point for every dollar you spend. And you can redeem those fuel points at any Kroger fuel center today. So you're already buying your stuff at your local Kroger. Make sure you also use that to save yourself money at the uh, pump there as well with that uh, that Kroger Shoppers card. So make sure you get that and find out more at your local Kroger here today for a lot more on that. All right, we're going to do some uh, Georgia recruiting talk here coming up in a moment with Jeff Sintel. That's going to be a lot of fun. Prior to that, I want to go around the doghouse. Around the doghouse today is poured by our friends at the Finish Long Drink, and it's been a busy week here around Dog Nation. Obviously, I've been here kind of locked in our studio the way that I always am, but we've had uh, Kaylee Manziel, Mike Griffith up in Indianapolis for the NFL Scouting Combine. And, you know, how, who's going to work out and who's going to do what? I think some of that's still to be determined, especially with Brock Bowers coming up perhaps later on today. But the one thing we do know is is that we have heard plenty of, from former Georgia players at the Combine this week. and In fact, I was just talking a moment ago about my belief that defensive line is perhaps the biggest issue for Georgia ahead of the upcoming season. ESPN had talked the other day about, oh, no, we think it may be defensive secondary. Well, in light of some of the things we're hearing at the NFL Scouting Combine this week, I want to start here for a moment with Javon Bullard making a very emphatic statement, warning, if you will, to those who think, you know, kind of a year removed from winning a national championship, a couple of national championships, that Georgia might be ready to take a step back, or perhaps this defensive secondary no longer with a Bullard, no longer with a Kamari Laster, who we're from in a moment, no longer with a Tyke Smith, who we'll hear from in a moment. Uh, Javon Bullard not only believes that Georgia is set up to be as strong as ever, but that defensive secondary, even in light of some of these departures, also set up to be as strong as ever. This is great stuff from Javon. George ain't going nowhere, man. George ain't going nowhere. And uh, I, I stand by that, and I mean that. George's going to be around for a long, long time. And uh, that, defensive back, uh, that defensive back room ain't going nowhere either. Those guys, those guys. You see, those guys were just, like you saw on Saturdays, who would start. You don't see what those guys do at practice. And, you know, and, and the flashes that they make. I mean, you got so many guys in that room. You got David Daniel, Dan Jackson, Jonell, Justin Rett, Ja'Cory, like, Everybody in that, and that's not even the, the, the name of the corners, man. And, you know, you got so many guys in that room that, that can play elite level of football, and I'm excited for them. So when you hear Javon Bullard says what he says there, and I've always loved listening to Javon speak just because I think he has such a authenticity to his words. I just really like that. Uh, that when you hear that, um, I mean, if you had any concern about the Georgia secondary, wouldn't a lot of that concern be alleviated just because of – what Bullard says he thinks he sees in the in the the you know the the guys that are left over in that Georgia secondary as as Javon gets ready to move on to the NFL draft. I just think those are really strong words from uh, Bullard overall, one of the more beloved players uh, from Georgia from this previous era. And speaking of beloved players, obviously perhaps nobody more so in recent years than Brock Bowers, who is really one of the more I think observed players in Indianapolis this week. There's a huge, maybe saw some of the photos. Huge contingent around him in Indy this week when he spoke to reporters. Now, Brock doesn't say very much of, of note, which is uh, certainly his prerogative, but a lot of folks are curious to talk, to hear from him just because he could be such a megawatt factor in the uh, first round coming up in just a few weeks. So we're going to kind of give you a little bit of a taste of what a lot of folks had to say. I thought that was great stuff from Javon Bullard a moment ago, touting Georgia, kind of staying on top, touting the Georgia defensive secondary. Also some really good stuff from Brock Bowers here there as well as he gets ready to transition to just really one of the most buzzed about draft prospects ahead of the upcoming NFL draft. Also Brock Bowers here from this week. 
Um, I'd say being here. I mean, it's just kind of uh, you kind of think about it when you're growing up. You watch it on TV, and um, it's just kind of cool being here. And just say that. I mean, people said to just take it in. I've been trying to do that, um, no matter what it is, whether I'm just sitting around waiting. Just uh, know that. Uh, I mean, this is this is what I've been looking forward to pretty much my whole life, and just wanting to move on to the next level. So I mean, that was it's it's pretty cool just looking around and seeing all this stuff. Yeah, Georgia helped me. I mean, a ton. I mean, obviously, we, we were going against first round dudes in defense every single day in practice so that like just that kind of development uh, going against that kind of competition every day really kind of improved my game and helped me out there's something about seeing bowers in that environment wearing the sort of generic nfl shirt talking about his nfl future and some of the questions you get in a situation like that are like from the nfl point of view a lot of the people who are there are obviously nfl reporters so they're asking nfl related questions to bowers and for someone like me, who obviously has, like all of you, just loved Brock in the Georgia uniform these last three years, the realization of, gosh, that's over. Like, Brock's not going to play for Georgia again. There's something about that that becomes very apparent during a, a press conference like that, even one in which, you know, Bauer's not exactly giving the most exciting, volatile quotes. Uh, it is certainly kind of the realization of this is the transition. Bowers is leaving the college world to go to the NFL world, and we believe that he's going to be very well received once he gets there. You love him saying – at the end of that clip there, how Georgia made him better while he was here. He was not the only one speaking that way uh, this week at the scouting combine. Tyke Smith, who had a pretty interesting road to travel from West Virginia through his time at UGA, kind of a long, winding road. He sort of echoed some of those same sentiments by also talking about specifically what it was about Georgia that made him a better football player while he's here. Here's Tyke Smith. So, yeah, I think um, Georgia developed me mentally just showing me all the stuff outside of football. I think I was a, a real good, a, a real good, real good football player once I transferred in. So them being able to show me like the mental uh, side of how to handle the meetings, the long meetings that we do, the walkthroughs, all the stuff outside of football, and then being able to handle yourself like a young man, and then uh, them helping me become the best version of myself. I just think that's a really uh, interesting statement from Tyke there, just because. Look, Tyke battled some injury, obviously near the beginning of his Georgia career, but I think there's also some you know, chatter in the rumor mill, people who know somebody who knows somebody will know somebody who will probably tell you that maybe Georgia wasn't quite so sure what it had in Tyke Smith when he first got here. Maybe, you know, just to be completely frank, maybe he wasn't running quite as fast as they expect their defense backs to run or, you know, things like that, that there may have been some some concern at the early stages of how good of a fit is Tyke Smith going to be at a place like Georgia. And sometimes the transfer portal kind of does that, where it's like this guy put up big, you know, production playing for his previous school, but you get him on campus somewhere and all of a sudden he didn't really feel like a great fit at a place like that. And that could have been the story for Tyke Smith, you know, kind of a round peg in a square hole at a place like Georgia. But after a long and winding road that included overcoming some injuries this past season, go look at statistical categories and look how impactful Tyke Smith was kind of all over the place when it comes to some key statistical categories for Georgia. That he really made himself into a player here at UGA after getting off to a slow start. And some of that is, as Tyke says, hey, Georgia made me better. But some of that's also about Tyke the man himself to say, you know what, nothing was given to you here, and maybe there was some thought that you weren't going to be able to take it. And yet, eventually, you did find your spot. Eventually, you did you know, take some playing time for yourself, and you made a real impact on the 2023 season. I think that Tyke deserves a lot of credit for that. And that's one of the reasons why you know, the NFL draft is probably not my favorite thing overall. But one of the reasons I do enjoy it is because I do think a lot of times what you see come out of it is sort of that personal story of, hey, this is the man I became while I was playing in college. This is the player I became while I was playing in college. And certainly Tyke Smith's got a lot to say when it comes to all of that. And someone else who always seemingly has a lot to say there as well is Georgia cornerback Kamari Laster, former cornerback now Kamari Laster. And he told a very funny story. A lot of you know that Kirby Smart has a way of trying to save his vocal cords and make it easy for everybody to hear him on the practice field. He uses a microphone to communicate during practice. The problem is, is that, you know, Kirby's pretty candid during practice, and that microphone certainly amplifies uh, the things that Kirby Smart has to say. And a lot of players can tell you stories about times of being just absolutely berated and screamed at by Kirby with the use of the microphone during the practice field, on the practice field. And I thought Kamari Laster told you some funny stuff about that this week here as well. Let me let you hear uh, Kamari here too as we're kind of going through some of the highlights of the NFL scouting combine. Here's Kamari Lasseter. Favorite Mike story by Coach Smart. Um, I just remember one time he was screaming on the mic so loud that after practice, uh, 
one of my friends back at the dorm said that he could hear him back over there around at, uh, at ECV. So you know, he was just screaming in general at all of us. Just, I guess we weren't just having one of our best days and uh, he let us hear it. Oh yeah, I, I got it. I got it a bunch. I mean, uh, but that's, that's just what, you know, that's what helped me, you know, just him just except me being able to accept the hard coaching and just hearing the hearing the message not the tone i mean it's just that's just his way of showing his passion for the game and showing how much he just wants us to be able to you know just execute at a high level first of all i love the line there at the end you talk about wisdom he says when it come to kirby smart and so the hard coaching that you're going to get the sec level and that kirby smart's going to give you he says hear the message not the tone is that not great that's that's like a really strong phrase from last day hear the message not the tone i think that's probably pretty good now, the other part is, and I admit I find this fascinating, like I don't live in Athens, but I am around Athens sometimes, and anybody who's around there, especially on campus, will tell you, is that you can hear the sounds of the practice field like a long way away. And I'm always kind of fascinated. Like Kirby Smart's like the most secretive guy in the world, and the practice stuff, you know, they expect that to be like under like lock and key. And yet the actual words that Kirby Smart uses during practice, sometimes you can you can hear it all the way across, the, just depending on how sound might be traveling a day, you know, particular day. You can sort of hear it all over the place. And you know, there have been moments when people have tried to capture that. There was the famous thing before the Tennessee game or whatever. But it is kind of funny that Kamari's like, I've had people tell me they heard him talking all the way you know, across campus, whatever that was, just because it can be really loud. Kirby's already pretty loud. You let him be amplified by a microphone, he's even louder. So uh, pretty funny stuff coming from uh, Kamari Laster and all that. And I would remind you, if you want the full conversation with Kamari and Tyke, Javon Bullard, Brock Bowers, uh, guys who, uh, Zion Lowe, we played some of that for you yesterday. If you want sort of the full complement of a lot of the guys we've been hearing from, if you go to the Dog Nation YouTube page, you can just sort of take your time and on demand, just kind of scroll through that and watch as much of that as you want to. And, of course, more coming from Dog Nation in Indianapolis today. We'll hear from Mike Griffith, Kaylee Manziel throughout the day as they kind of observe all of that going on. For now, though, that's around the doghouse. It's poured today by our friends at the Finish Long Drink. And, of course, we're heading towards a weekend. You know, listen, looking forward to kick back, relax maybe a little bit, and just sort of reflect on the week that was. No better way to do that than right there with the Finish Long Drink. You know, I told you, a lot of times I like to drink the Finish Long Drink outside. It's sort of a fun thing to do. This may be one of those weekends because it's kind of cold and rainy today. Maybe it's a garage day for you. Put a little sad country music on, sit in the garage, listen to it rain, enjoy yourself a Finish Long Drink. That sounds pretty good to me. And here in the Peach State, maybe no better option for you on that than a peach-flavored version of the Finish Long Drink. Or maybe you want the Long Drink Cranberry. Maybe you want the Long Drink Strong, 8.5% alcohol by volume. Long Drink Zero, no carbs, no sugar. Long Drink Traditional. I'm sort of a traditionalist. Maybe no, maybe no surprise that I like the traditional version of the finished long drink, the grapefruit flavor, the gin kick, whichever version you want. Just kind of a cool story of how it got to America from Finland in the 1950s after being a part of the uh, summer games in Helsinki. It's been in Georgia now for a little while here. We've been telling you about it for a good number of years. And you can try some yourself. So please check them out online, thelongdrink.com. You can find out where to pick some up, and you can enjoy this delicious, great tasting, sort of, uh, we think the best tasting version in this category of ready to drink cocktails, mixed drinks that you don't have to mix yourself. We think the finished long drinks, the best tasting of them all. So you can find them online. It's uh, the long drink.com. That is the long drink.com. All right. Finished long drink brings around the dog house to you here today. We are running a little bit late. That is on me. So we'll see if we can pick up the pace here a little bit. A lot of UGA recruiting news to get to. And by the way, also a little bit of a version of Jeff Centel for our golden shoe later on today. There. Well, so we'll kind of tease ahead on all of that. But for now, what's next for Julian Lewis and another 2025 quarterback perhaps in the mix and potential changes to National Signing Day? A lot to get to. Let's cover all of that ground as we welcome on Jeff Sintel here today on Dog Nation Daily presented by Kroger. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Well, let's say hello to Jeff Sintel here on Dog Nation Daily presented by Kroger. Uh, Jeff, sorry for getting to you a little late here because there's a lot of folks who want to hear a lot of really good recruiting information with you. I want to start with 2025 quarterbacks here for a moment, sort of work backwards and work our way more to the present tense. You know, the other day at DogNation.com, a very interesting story as it relates to Julian Juju Lewis. He has kind of come out with another announcement, another crop of visits here that he's getting ready to take during the month of March. And, you know, the chatter that we see online and obviously your own personal private conversations is that it does seem like 
Georgia is legitimately in the mix here, perhaps even more than just a hat on the table here for right now. Technically speaking, still committed to USC, I guess. He is visiting uh, the Trojans, I believe, at the end of the month. But as we kind of talk about 2025 quarterbacks here for a moment, let me start with the Lewis part of this, that we're kind of led to believe that in very complicated recruitings that involve, we would assume, a lot of NIL and a lot of, you know, sort of aggressive sort of suitors in addition to Georgia, that's not always Georgia's cup of tea. But perhaps is that different when it comes to Julian Lewis in this situation? Let's start right there, if you don't mind. Yeah. Hey, uh, good morning, everybody, Brandon. Like the sweater. That's a very old school type letter sweater mm, you got you. going on. Thank you. Um, you know, I think our Connor Riley had a good term for it. You know, t- Connor has a great cynical sense of humor sometimes, but he called it a situation ship, how he described uh, his reading of how things are with USC and Juju Lewis. So he's going to take a bunch of visits, man. And he's going to take it. Those are all unofficial visits, I've been told. And then he's going to probably take some more visits, some official visits. I think the thing you're kicking at, Brent, I don't know if you saw the, saw the story this week. It was a Yahoo.com report um, how they estimated that Juju made about $10 million over two years at Southern Cal. And of course, not all of that was collective. It was a, I, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with this, but he had like a Wendy's deal. He had a Dr. Pepper deal. About he Caleb some, Williams, Caleb Williams, right? Yeah. 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 yeah Caleb Williams. Yeah. And, and I guess the comparative statement there is like, is that the sort of things that's going to be there for Ju- Juju? Should he stick with his USC, USC commitment? I don't know. I think USC learned a little bit. First of all, my first reaction to that story, if they were paying that much, but again, it's not them paying that much. It's being a, that big of a star and then drawing in the non-collective funds. I think my thinking on Julian in Georgia is if Georgia does win the race for Julian, his father has told me that you know they're not going to take the highest bid. The highest bid, they're not currently committed to the highest bid. And I think it's going to have to take the power, maybe peripheral brands in the state of Georgia it's not going to be the money coming in or the collective money coming in that I think would ultimately sway should Julian choose Georgia. I think it would be big national brands. And I've already exceeded my free plug with one national brand in this answer already. So I'll just stick to, you know, the big boys, you know, the great A's that are around the state of Georgia. And that's kind of what Stetson Bennett got a little bit of and Brock Bowers got a little bit of. But if you multiply that with a quarterback that's a Heisman Trophy candidate, I think you can get into some real money where it's not exhausting Georgia's collective to allocate uh, that many dollars to QB1. I I think he's going to really look around. It's interesting how Colorado is now in the picture because they hired a former NFL coordinator, and that's a lot of NFL experience. I really think Julian just wants to play ball. This is a very complicated time in his life. He knows he's going to get his money wherever he goes. But I think I think one thing that I believe will happen with Julian at the college level is that money, he's going to let his father handle all that, kind of be his advocate, his agent for a lot of that. All he wants to do is play ball and win. And I think the main reason George is in this thing, and I really think they are in this thing, Brandon, is because he knows he's going to win. And he told me point blank, he's like, Georgia's going to have players like me, except they're like 100 pounds heavier and six seven, six or seven inches taller. He wants to be surrounded by similar talents to go chase championships. So let me try to be intellectually consistent here for a moment, which maybe not always the easiest thing for me to do. But um, I just spent about 10 minutes off the top of the show saying Kirby Smart talks about offensive and defensive linemen. And then in the next phase of NIL, which I believe is going to be more like the allocation phase of, okay, you've raised all the dollars you can raise. How are you going to choose to spend them? Jeff, I believe if I had like, let's say it's $2 million, I could give Julian Lewis $2 million, or I could use $2 million to get the best offensive line for the quarterback that does eventually start for Georgia. I think I'm at the phase now where I think I'd rather have the elite offensive line than the elite quarterback. Georgia won two national championships with a quarterback who became a Heisman finalist, but was only a second-round pick. It was not an elite recruit coming out of high school. And I'm not saying that I don't want elite quarterback, or I'm not saying that I don't want elite wide receiver. But the truth is, listen to Kirby Smart talk, elite offensive lines may be more rare than elite quarterback wide receiver. And if everybody's chasing those skill positions with the dollars – then 
Yeah, dadgummit, Jeff, maybe George is just better off putting a whole bunch of money in the direction of the very best offensive line that he can get, letting somebody else battle it out for the quarterback, find a good quarterback to play behind a great offensive line, and start stacking some more trophies. Yeah, I'm going to ride with you a little bit on that one, Brandon. I think one of the things I'm watching, and it's been clear to me while watching the NFL Combine coverage, is Georgia only has one defensive lineman there. And to me, that's probably the reason why Georgia wasn't Georgia a year ago. Georgia was very good. Georgia was a top two, top three, top one team last year. But they weren't uh, the Georgias of the years past, or those elite defensive linemen, those elite front guys. Georgia went through a stretch. We all know Trayvon Walker, uh, Jordan Davis, J- Jalen Carter, Devontae Wyatt. They didn't have exactly one of those dudes uh, on last year's team. Now, I think Nazir Stackhouse, Warren Brinson, those guys will come back. Uh, those guys will really help Georgia out a lot. And those guys will probably end up day three picks, maybe day two, day three picks. They'll be third, fourth round type type defensive linemen. Maybe a little higher for Nazir, but I think the difference is, is purely, I, I think I've tried to be, like you said, uh, intellectually consistent. I'm trying to be rationally consistent. I have always, when I look at recruiting, I think big people that move people around, that push people around offensive and defensive lines are very much still the nature of the game. You watch the NFL, Brandon, when it gets to the the playoffs, all those teams that threw it 30, 40 times a game, they start running the ball. And that's how they advance through the playoff bracket in the postseason in January. I still think that's football, no matter how much they try to change it into kind of underwear Olympics or glorified seven on seven with pass routes and how much you can literally lay your hands on receivers. I think I, I think about this NIL, Brandon, in the, the days going forward, and it reminds me of late 90s, early 2000s, as how frustrating it was to follow the Atlanta Braves because they just weren't spending. Or if they spent a lot of money on their pitching staff, they had to go with a mediocre and average talent for the National League at first base or third base, or they would have to plug with a lot of rookies. And other school, other teams were spending a lot more. I think it is going to be, in some respects, a salary cap league. And I like the way you're thinking. It's a rational way to share that message in terms of if you're spending all your money on your quarterback, who's going to protect them? Like Georgia's got a model. Somehow they're winning. I think it's 69 and six since 2019. They're winning without first round quarterbacks, without first round receivers. They're winning with a Georgia model. And I don't think Kirby Smart really needs to change that drastically and I think the Julian piece is just very interesting because I think the hardest part of the whole Julian Lewis to Georgia saga storyline is I don't expect him to come in right away at Georgia and play I I have that much confidence in a Gunnar Stockton and I have that much confidence in a Ryan Puglisi but the flip side of that is no freshman quarterback has really came in and played for Kirby Smart except for Jacob Eason and then Jake Fromm now those were kind of dire situations where they didn't have four stars, five stars stacked up in the room as well. And I think Georgia's kind of way with their young quarterback is sending them through a year of the gauntlet scout team practices where that future all pro defense kind of chews on them. And then Kirby Smart and Mike Bobo know exactly what they have. And that's kind of the way, been the way Georgia has groomed quarterbacks over the years. I think that's why Carson Beck's so successful. I think that's why Stetson Bennett was so successful. And I think that's going to be interesting to look at in the, in the, in the years to come. So, Going kind of rapid fire here for a little bit, you know, a guy that you've written about at DogNation.com, Matt Zollers, four-star. He kind of reminds me of this year's version of Ryan Puglisi a little bit. I think he has a chance to be an Elite 11 quarterback. He's sort of ranked inside the top 200, but he's not ranked inside, like I said, the top 50, and he's certainly not a five-star here right now. Is this the kind of quarterback then that we're talking about? And I'm not anti-Juju. I'm really, really not. Obviously, I'm not. But is someone like Zollers a little bit more in keeping with what we're saying here, which is – if you can have the best offensive line, good at quarterback might be good enough. Is that what Matt Zollers perhaps is going to end up being? Well, it's funny, Brandon. There's been a bit of a news flash with Zollers. Uh, I think uh, people have started to look at him. They started to kick the tires on that junior tape. And ironically, on three now has Zollers rated higher than Juju on hmm. their pure on three rating. Zollers, I believe, is the number 17 overall prospect for on three, number two number three quarterback in the country juju's like number 22 so that's that's interesting i think zollers has reached the point he's going to be brandon it's going to keep going up for him he's going to be a top one top he's already top 85 on the on three industry ranking 
and climbing. And this is a guy, Brandon, I love this part of his story. He was very forthright. He didn't have an offer this time a year ago. Brandon, that's very strange, very peculiar in this day and age. You see that highlight clip right there. I had to watch it about two or three times. He literally lets that ball go, and it, the ball travels like 61 yards, 62 yards in the air. The thing about him is he's very – he's a former receiver. He's a former running back. He is very, very fast. Like the first play on this tape is a 70-yard run where he makes a defensive end miss. So Zoller's – trying to keep with the speed of your pace of your questioning here. I think you're going to find out he's going to be as highly rated as anybody when all the rankings are done. We just talked about offensive and defensive linemen a lot. We've also said over and over again, this is an incredibly deep year for both offensive and defensive line. Here in the state of Georgia, you had a chance to visit with Josh Pettis, Petty from Fellowship Christian the other day. Uh, how did you find Mr. Petty when you get a chance to speak to him? Well, first of all, very impressive kid, very intelligent kid. But, Brent, I know I wanted to have fun with you on this question. He's got, you were talking about allocations, right? Yeah. He, he had a hip fracture uh, in the state file in wrestling. He's going to miss about six to eight weeks. But really his spring to-do list is he said he was down to 255 in wrestling season. Brandon, that's not good. That's not great for a future Georgia offensive lineman, for Coach Searles at least. And he's got a mission to get up to 285 by the time his senior season rolls around. To do so, he's going to ingest 350 to 400 grams of protein per day and up to 7,000 calories per day to stack on that weight. Brendan, that is a staggering number. It is a mathematician's number that's going to be accomplished through a lot of protein shakes. My question for you, sir, is how in the world are you getting that 400 grams of protein and 7,000 calories on a daily business? Like, what's your salary kept there? You, you can't be on a Royal Caribbean cruise ship either. You act like I won't get that done this weekend. Listen, you give me a big plate of wings here and some sides to go <laughs> along with that, a little barbecue for dinner. I mean, I <laughs> what scares me about this is we hear these stories of, oh, so-and-so is going to do this insane diet in order to be able to pick, pack on weight. When you start doing the math, and I start kind of doing the sort of, you know, kind of looking back on my recent week of eating, you sort of realize <sighs> – I wish that was a little harder for me than it sounds like it is for, you know, a, a young man like this. I, unfortunately, if he spent a little time with me, he may find out that packing on that kind of weight. I mean, that's basically just a you know, weekend's worth of work for me as it is. It's kind of like Brandon on the cruise ship because he told me, uh, and I got to reiterate, 4.12 student, great kid, great young man, loves the fact that George is recruiting him. He called it a very special part, very special recruiting process so far, but Brandon, he's going to have four protein shakes a day. That would kind of take some of the fun out of it a little bit. But he also said he has a breakfast, a lunch, a second lunch, and then a dinner. So he's eating two lunches, man, during the day. I was waiting for him to say, yeah, I've got a lunch after dinner or whatever as well. But to, And he said that last protein shake has got a major core of uh, protein and calories and everything else to kind of tide him off over the over the, while he's sleeping, man. But Man, I don't know, man. I, I sit there and I think about the protein shakes I have every day, man. And it'd take about 10 of those, uh, or at least eight or nine of those to get to that number for me. All right, two quick things here. Thing number one, we need to normalize second lunch. I just feel like I feel like it's good for the economy. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like I'm always hungry around, like, say, 3 p.m. And it just se seems so socially unacceptable to eat at 3 because you got dinner coming up in a couple of hours. I feel like we need to normalize second lunch. It kind of needs a name. You know, I grew up, people talk about supper. You know, maybe you could have supper and dinner, or like dinner comes at like three, supper comes at night. I, I, feel like, I feel like we need to normalize second lunch. And the other thing is, I'm no dietitian. People should consult their own experts, I guess. But this idea that you need protein shakes, Milkshakes already have protein. They're made with ice cream. That's made with dairy. That's That's got protein in it. Like, you know, this notion of you have to have a special category of shakes. Milkshakes already have protein. So I, I got your problem solved right there. Brennan, I don't think Metrics is coming in as a sponsor anytime soon for us. Um, hey, this is a food story I got to ask you about. Did you see the one about the giant fast food, re fast food service chain that wants surge pricing for their for their menu like an uber i mean that's diabolical isn't that anti-american my friend well I, I think so and i'll tell you my thought on this which is if you go to these places any kind of like regular fast food place you know this idea well it's cheaper at 3 p.m but if you ever try to get service at a fast food restaurant like 3 3 30 p.m they don't care about you they don't care about you being there you know the idea well the food's cheaper later on it's also the same food that's been sitting in the warmer since 11 30 in the morning like 
uh, I, I found that to be pretty distasteful. And I don't listen. I'm not going to you know mention the, the place by name necessarily. Um, but you know this idea we're going to charge you more for the food at noon. That's like the only time all day long the food's fresh. You know, you know three four o'clock is sort of a wasteland when it comes to a lot of these you know fast food joints. So no, Jeff, I was not happy about hearing about that. Awesome, man. Hey, side road there. We got lots of recruits to talk about if you still want to go down. All right, yeah, real quickly here. uh, Isaiah Gibson, pass rusher out of the WR. Uh, I like this young man a lot, and it sounds like Dog Nation is going to find some stuff they can like about him there as well. Yeah, let's let's be nice to a sponsor here. It sounds like he he went to the UGA bookstore, Brandon, right before he went to the Under Armour camp. You roll out and you see him, and he's got Georgia slides. Do you even have Georgia slides? I doubt even you have Georgia slides, but – He's got uh, he's got a backpack. He had a Georgia hoodie, and he was a guy that really he's very happy with the way Georgia's recruiting him. Georgia has moved him where his primary contact has gone from uh, Coach Trey Scott as a defensive end guy to Coach Uzo Deribe, which is a uh, traditional Wolfpack edge outside linebacker recruiting emphasis. Now that's where the way Georgia sees him. Brendan, he had 17 sacks for the WR. The WR definitely plays a a1A type schedule. He had 51 quarterbacks pressures. I love how that stat on the catapult had him at 18.6 miles per hour a year ago as a junior. And, you know, to tell you how Uzo Deribe gets down, uh, Isaiah was sharing a story at the Under Armour camp and he was like, hey, man, I just got through talking to uh, Coach Deribe before I came out to this camp and he's in Miami with his wife on vacation. And tell you how Uzo Deribe works. He may be off the clock, but he's never stopped recruiting. And Gibson Brandon, I think is interesting. A little context there is Georgia's looking at a lot of lot a lot of edge guys this year because the cycle allows it. They didn't get an edge guy last year, a true edge guy last year. They did in 2023. So they're going to get two or three this year. And there's a young man by named Darren Akabron up in uh, New Jersey. Seems like he really likes Georgia. Georgia was his number one coming out of a visit. He's got two more visits scheduled to see the dogs. There's Jared Smith, there's Zion Grady, and then there's Isaiah Gibson. Gibson was the one of those three, Smith, Gibson, and uh, Grady were all there at the Under Armour camp. And the most buzz coming out of those three was Gibson. His rankings for on three vaulted all the way up to a top 25 overall prospect in the country, the number two edge in the country. He's got big frame. He's got big edge. Everybody loves those uh, homegrown Georgia talents right here. So that's a name that I think for me, Isaiah is moving up the board, not just because he flashed all that gear at the Combine, because he really showed a great skill set. He wanted to compete. He wanted to knock out some reps when perhaps some others didn't. And Gibson, he said he wore that gear, Brandon, uh, basically because he wanted to show respect to the way Georgia has been recruiting him so far. I love that. Something else I love, you had a really good story this week, Travis Smith, the receiver, and obviously we talked uh, Terrence Edwards about Travis yesterday. And, you know, it seems like he's really taken to James Coley very well, which is, I mean, not a surprise. James Coley's always been a good recruiter. That's why he's back at Georgia here right now. You know, Coley's pretty well known to a lot of our audience. Josh Crawford, not quite as well known, but gosh, we we just love the. the t- you mentioned, you know, Lee County, Coquit County, uh, uh, Valdosta. He's got you know deep ties down there. Give me a little bit of a thumbnail sketch on Coley, a little bit more well known. Crawford uh, needs a bit of an introduction, but how these guys are kind of already relating to recruits and the impact they could have right away on UGA recruiting. Yeah, I think the way to look at them is kind of look at the jobs ahead of them because everybody's going to judge Josh Crawford, man, against Dell. And that standard that Dell set up is pretty amazing. I, I'll i give you an example. Uh, Dell had been cooking for over a year, year plus for both Alvin Henderson out of Alabama and then a Kylan Deer out of Mississippi. And Deer has been Dell's kind of one of his, his main target for over a year, daily Bible verses and everything else. I think it's going to be very hard for for Josh to get back in hard with the elite talents in the 2025 class for a lot of reasons. Georgia's running back room is supposed to return a lot of guys. You see some of those guys there, Andrew Paul, Roderick Robinson, but then they signed the three guys in 2025. You add in Bo Walker, who still seems very committed to the dogs. And that that room is going to be pretty hard to fill with another elite name in 2025. That's why I think Josh's best – you know, attaboy or, you know, fireworks, uh, big boom recruiting might have to happen in 2026 in state. But, and then you look at Coley, Coley's going to be a great recruiter. He's going to open up pockets of South Florida and now Texas, and he's going to get Georgia in the top three and top four with a lot of really strong, talented players. But 
I think there's a ceiling there in terms of the top five guys. They're going to wind up NIL players, and that's going to be very hard for Georgia. We talked about salary cap allocation before. Uh, we try to really quickly phrase it that way. Maybe that's not the most uh, precise or tidy way to do it, but I think that's a modern reality of it, and I think it's going to be hard for Coley to to get that George Pickens type uh, in the years to come, but I think he can do very well. I think this year is probably the year where Terrence Edwards will be beaming uh, at the thought of potentially Georgia adding C.J. Wiley and Travis Smith Jr. to yeah. his protégés to the class. And, Brandon, it just makes sense there because they're not that highly rated. I think they're a little bit undervalued. They want to stay home. They've already built relationships in Georgia. And I think that's going to help Georgia with those players in terms of – and let's face it, Georgia has has made a lot of hay, scored a lot of touchdowns with – out that elite receiver coming out of high school over this surge for the Kirby era. So I think that's going to be a good thing. And I want to tell you, Brandon, one player that everyone should be impressed with is Wiley. Uh, he's 6'4", he's 196, he's running track. He's going to get that 100 under uh, 11 seconds, which is kind of like a golden barrier. But you look at that tape, Brandon, you and I both know that Milton High School does not play any Kool-Aid teams. They get after it. They have a challenging schedule, and he just ripped through some teams last year, Brandon. He was stacking up through the last half of the season, stacking up 170-yard games, 200-yard games, 80 in the 90-yard games, 150-yard games, week after week after week. Ends up with 14 touchdowns, ends up with 1,470 yards on 68 catches, and he has a variety of route tree uh, examples. But there's a lot of plays on his tape, Brandon, a lot of plays where that young man is going deep. Uh, Luke Nicholas chucking yeah. it. And there are a lot of big 40, 50 yard explosives, and he's catching the ball and running the green grass. Well, I was going to say that, you know, Luke Nichols, a quarterback that's going to Miami, he's been committed to Miami for, you know, a, a good long time. Um, kind of under the radar as a player a little bit, but he's a good quarterback. And for a guy like Wiley, DeBron Gatling would have been like this too. For a guy like Wiley to play with like that level of quarterback, you know, not the most famous quarterback in America, but if you watch Milton play, you're seeing a good, capable quarterback who's delivering the football and throwing a catchable wall, a catchable ball. I just think for someone like Wiley, that really aids his development because he's playing with a capable signal caller. Not the most famous quarterback in America, not the kind of guy that's going to be in this sort of Julian Lewis conversation necessarily, but he is dadgum good. And um, I just think that really helps with Wiley's development. Uh, and, and anybody like that, if you're playing with that sort of, you know, power five or power four, I guess now, power, you know, power conference level quarterback, you're just getting a chance to catch more balls and getting a chance to sort of play a traditional true receiver. And I, I like Wiley more because, as you said, of the competition that Milton plays and the offense that he gets a chance to play a, a part of there with Ben Reeves. Man, there's a lot more juice on Wiley. His dad played at LSU. His mom was a track athlete at LSU. And his dad goes on and plays with like four or five teams in the NFL. So he's got that kind of pedigree, got that kind of background. And the fact that he's running track, Brandon, he doesn't mind blocking. He doesn't mind getting physical. I mean, there's a lot of boxes. We all we all know there's a Georgia guy that we have kind of developed and kind of shared the template on him. But when mm -hmm. you can have NFL bloodlines – and you can have a uh, track background at receiver. You can have size. You don't mind blocking to get the rock. But the other thing there, Brandon, with Wiley, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but his former high school teammate was uh, Ethan Barbour at Alpharetta. He moved from Alpharetta to Milton, and those two guys grew up together. Barbour actually gave Wiley his nickname, which is a, you can't be a great player these days, man, without a great nickname. Sure. And they, they call him C4 because obviously CJ Wiley, but he wears number four for Milton and C4 is obviously explosive. We see that in movies all the time, yeah. but uh, that's a guy Georgia. I think Georgia fans could be very gleefully happy if that, if that first year Coley class includes a guy like a CJ Wiley and a Travis Smith, and then maybe one or two other choice names from there. All right. We're obnoxiously late, but I do want to ask you about this. And I think our audience needs to try to understand all of this. It seems like we're heading for more change with National Signing Day. I'd be in favor of change. I've told you a million times I do not like Signing Day on, like, December the 21st. I just think that's the probably the worst single time it could uh, happen. However, when you hear about the discussion of change, what you realize is the proposed changes for various reasons might not be much better. We've heard about the idea of the early part of December, which would right there be, you know, conference championship weekend, which for now would seem to be a pretty strange place to have it. We're hearing about late June. On the one hand, that seems to make some sense to add a signing period there because guys take their official visits in June. Coaches could sign them and then have a little bit of July vacation time, which I know 
for coaches, and let's just be honest, you can't work 365 days a year. July's but the only time you can take vacation. And yet the high school coaches, and I am very sympathetic to this, are saying, well, gosh, if you have a bunch of guys, you know, you know, looking to sign around that time, you're going to have more opt-outs, more guys like skipping their senior season because their college decision's already made. I take that pretty seriously, and I do not think that would be a positive change, you know, for the sport overall, for the young men who play the sport. What do you make, Jeff, of, like, where all of this is heading? I think this is a pretty serious topic. It's early days, but, man, it feels like this is one of those things we're going to be talking a lot about one way or another. Yeah, it's kind of convoluted, Brandon. It's kind of like a confluence of factors. First of all, I'm going to have a radical thought here. I don't even know if the February signing date even matters anymore. Why not at that point we'll have them sign in May? Because you're not going to early enrollee and they're already thinking about you being a year away. I think that's an antiquated uh, number right there, antiquated date on the calendar. The other thing, Brandon, is you mentioned a couple of those things, but like it, there's just there's just barriers. There's just impediments in any way you want to look at it. Check this. So like if you, you try to do it after the conference championship week, Brandon, you mentioned high school programs and high school coaches. That's in the thick of the Georgia high school state playoffs or any high any state association state playoffs. That's not really a good time. The reason why December is so bad now is you've got transfer portal spots you're thinking about and also early signing day, early enrollee guys you're thinking about. Not to mention the advent of the 12-team playoff coming here when everybody's going to sit there and try to win football games, multiple football games in a playoff bracket, in a championship bracket in December. December's a wasteland. I think they should get to somewhere like late July. Maybe, you know, because everybody's still visiting in june and they're deciding in july so late the late july let them sign and i think that kind of creates a lot of that kind of moves a lot of the kind of traffic recruiting traffic off to the side i was looking at this um i was looking at this when this story was kind of breaking and i looked at george's class and where what where it wound up and how many of those guys would have signed uh in july and probably about 2022 20, of those guys would have signed in july of course it complicates things the one thing that you ha that haven't heard reported or mentioned in any of these stories is you got to give these young men an out clause because I just laid out that most of George's class would have signed in July had this ruling or this model been in effect back then. Think about that. Dylan Riola would have signed with Georgia, uh, and then that would have gotten gotten a little twisted down down towards the end. I think you got to give these kids if you're signing in June or July, whatever arbitrary date you're looking for, you got to give them a way out with a coordinator change, head coach change, or any sort of season change. And there's really not a good time in anymore in December to do it. Like it's just, that's just kind of what it is. You've, I've heard some thoughts from people that I respect that said, you know, just wait until after January the 15th and have them sign after the, after the period, we you know, where you, you could sign sometime in the summer, you would have two signing dates. You would get rid of the early guys. And then the ones that wanted to wait, could wait, and it would be after a transfer portal. It would be after playoffs. It would be after a lot of things, after the high school season, and it would be close enough that that February date where people are kind of already know what they want to do by then. I think they've got a lot of things to think about. Here's what I'm going to predict, Brandon. They're not going to make it completely better. They're just going to make it incrementally better with what they're trying to do. And a lot of young men now with the collectives and the NIL, Brandon, They've kind of figured out what they're doing anyway, so they don't mind signing something else in the month of July. All right, Jeff, really good stuff. Appreciate you being here as part of Dog Nation Daily presented by Kroger. We know you'll have a lot of great stuff coming here at dognation.com. Hope you enjoy the weekend there too. And we'll look forward to talking to you back here on Dog Nation Daily presented by Kroger again next week there as well. And stay tuned, by the way, uh, Jeff Sintel, a, a big part of our uh, golden shoe today there as well. So, Jeff, I'll do a little bit of a tease ahead there on that. Wow, good job, man. Hey, uh, Keep going, man. I think you got 300 more grams of protein to go today, right? Yes, sir. You know we'll get there before it's all said and done. Appreciate it, Jeff. Talk to you soon. See you, man. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Fruit. Yeah, like second lunch, I'd be all about that. A milkshake as my beverage for every meal? Absolutely. Especially especially for a good cause. Hey, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help my body be what it needs to be to play college football. How great would that be? Gosh, I, I'm so envious of that. So envious that I'd be, if I was a college football player, probably no surprise, I'd be the one on the bad list of so-and-so needs to drop weight. <laughs> That'd be the one that I'd be on, uh, unfortunately. So, yeah, uh, pretty pretty good stuff there on all of that. What's not good is the proposed changes potentially coming to the college football playoff before you even get the expanded playoff. I'm going to get to that here in a moment. But prior to that, let's always start with good news ahead of bad news. And some great news is cruising. 
around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean and the excitement that it's being generated. Behind the scenes now, we're having like meetings all the time. Now, I hate meetings, to be completely frank, but I love meetings about our Dog Nation cruise coming up and really down just a few weeks. It's April. I was telling this to my, my boss um, the other day that you know, we talk about the Dog Nation cruise for an entire year, so it sort of always seems like it's a year away, but folks, it ain't. It is here and it's upon us. We're just a um, just a few weeks away from April 22nd, sailing out of Port Canaveral. And I always love Port Canaveral as our destination to sort of, in, sort of embarkation destination, if you will, uh, just because it's an easy port to get to. That's why we always select Port Canaveral, just kind of a short drive, sort of past Orlando. You're kind of down there at uh, Port Canaveral. It's the easiest port, I think, for us to uh, kind of get to uh, in most cases. So that's kind of always sort of the home port for our Dog Nation cruise. We're on Allure of the Seas. I've had so much fun the last couple of days. For those of you who watch on video, showing you some of the images, I mean, how just like stately and pristine does that vessel look sailing on the ocean there, Allure of the Seas, what a gorgeous ship that is. And how much fun are the pool decks there, kind of overlooking the Central Park neighborhood. Y'all, this is going to be uh, un, uh, a cruise vacation experience unlike any we've ever had. How about the Aqua Theater there on the back of the ship? See, that's what a lot of people maybe don't realize if you've been on our Dog Nation cruise before, hundreds of you have, and um, plenty more are going to be on their first Dog Nation cruise here right now. It's, it's all the new stuff we get a chance to be a part of because on an Oasis-class ship, that means the Aqua Theater. That means the two flow riders there on the back. That means the boardwalk neighborhood, which you can kind of see with the carousel and the experience there. That means the Central Park neighborhood. And uh, you see the mini golf and just all the fun things that you're able to do. I, I just love it. I can't wait to be on board with you. And if somehow you've kind of missed your opportunity to be on the Dog Nation cruise, trust me when I tell you that Royal Caribbean's got so many fun things happening here in 2024, including another Oasis-class ship. Utopia of the Seas debuting right there in Port Canaveral coming up in July. So Jessica Slater can tell you all about it. Give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. You can also email her, jslater at dreamvacations.com and check out royaldogs.com of the website if you want more information about our Dog Nation crew. So let's talk about some pretty big news around the uh, world of college football. We have been telling you now for days that despite the fact we haven't even gotten to the 12-team playoff yet, there's already a lot of energy for an expansion to 14 after these couple of years in which the 12-team playoff is going to be set. And the sort of weird news that we had a chance to react to the other day was that it would be kind of a sort of allocated, no, it's a lot, we've used that word a lot on the show today, but a lot of uh, spots in the playoff sort of allocated to the various conferences. And the SEC and the Big Ten originally wanted four, but they were willing to settle for three, which means there would be two playoff opportunities for both the ACC and the Big 12, one for the group of five, and then we're going to have three total at-larges. That is news we've already brought you here this week, a lot of this coming from Ross Dellinger. Well, Ross Dellinger's back out again today, or I should say yesterday, reporting on something else that's even stranger. So what Ross put out on Twitter yesterday was, or X, I need to call it, in the most circulated version of the proposed 14 playoff model, the one I was just describing, the champions of the SEC and Big Ten would be guaranteed the two first-round buys, the sources tell, Yahoo Sports. So what basically you're doing here is, in addition to sort of guaranteeing them more spots, they're also sort of being guaranteed buys, uh, you know, advancing in the playoffs, essentially. Like, this is being thought of as a huge attempt to sort of stack the deck in favor of the SEC and the Big Ten. Now, there are plenty of people who are going to say, all of this is just sort of a first salvo in a negotiation where perhaps the SEC and the Big Ten, figuratively speaking, take their ball and go home. They decide to sort of create their own playoff or something like that. They don't want to play with the lesser leagues. And perhaps that's where all this is going. But let me tell you the thought that comes to mind for me. And I, I do think this is the type of thing that it sounds so blowhardish to say you're only going to hear this here. But I do believe that there is a viewpoint we've tried to express on this that you're not hearing enough other places. And I would say it's one of the reasons why the college football conversation ends up being so frustrating. Look, the truth is just really, really important. And for a long time, I think that college football, the powers that be over the sport, whoever they might be in a given year, have tried to push you on a lie and get you to believe something that just simply wasn't true. And the thing that college football has wanted you to believe is that somehow the playing field, nationally speaking, was relatively even and equal. Now, there is a reason why the sport wanted to push this. This year's 
most recent year's college football playoff is the perfect example why. The CFP ratings this year were through the roof. America clearly responds to a Pacific Northwest team and a Southwest team and a Southeast team and a Midwest team, sort of four quadrants of the country all being represented. That's clearly good for business. It is totally understandable why college football would want to have it appear that the country is somewhat balanced and all the regions, all the time zones, they're all capable of producing great college football teams. Clearly, America responds in a positive way when that's the belief that seems to have some evidence to back it up. But largely speaking, for a very long time, that's simply not been true, that the sport isn't even and it isn't equal and a huge number of the very best teams in any given year are going to be right here in the Southeast. We know that. We understand that, right? And the reason why that's the case is because the very best players, broadly speaking, also exist in larger numbers down here in the Southeast. And I think one of the things that's super frustrating is if we would have said in the past, and we probably did, that the second best SEC team typically deserves to be in the playoff more so than the best team from one of these ACC, Big 12, Pac-12 type of leagues, there are a lot of years in which we would have just been laughed out of the room. Oh, you're an SEC homer. You're a redneck. That's kind of the way you were treated if you sort of viewed this sort of Southeast supremacy in college football. But now the official position of the people trying to put the next iteration of the playoff together essentially sort of code that into the format, that of course the SEC is better, Big Ten's becoming more like that. Of course, they need to be treated differently. We've been saying forever the SEC should be treated differently because it has the best teams. And for the most part, that was a non-starter as a discussion because college football wanted to pretend that the sport was more balanced than it really was. And anytime you're sort of building your entire edifice on a lie, eventually the chickens are going to kind of come home to roost, and perhaps that's what's happening here right now. And I want to say one final point about this when it comes to the imbalance of the future college football playoff and the special treatment that the Big Ten and the SEC might get. Some of the – we're just going to stick with the SEC here for a moment. Some of the special advantage that the SEC has seemed to enjoy, some of this is probably just luck, right? I mean, it's like, you know, it just so happens that better players live down here in the South, and that is objectively true. Recruiting rankings, NFL draft, all the ways in which players are evaluated – always kind of points back to that. It's inarguable that the better players live down here. It is, in some respects, just sort of luck that the SEC has that advantage. Also, the fact that, you know, some power programs like Oklahoma State can't do anything about the fact that it's in Stillwater, Oklahoma. That's a little bit of a backwater outpost. Texas Tech can't do anything about the fact that it's in Lubbock, way out there in the middle of West Texas, far removed from a lot of other places. Geographic location, if you're kind of a small sort of remote place. You can't do anything about that. That's certainly true. But the reason why this whole thing is frustrating for me is this point here, is that the advantage the SEC has enjoyed because of its geography, there are other programs who could have enjoyed a similar advantage, but for a long time, they just haven't tried hard enough. Miami in the ACC, Florida State in the ACC, Clemson, they've won a couple of championships, so you might exclude them from the, exclude them from this discussion. North Carolina from the SC, from the ACC, Texas from the old Big 12, USC from the Pac-12. Think about all the times over the course of the last 10, 15, 20 years you've seen these programs that have some geographic proximity to elite talent, but you look at the institutions, you look at the athletic departments, and you see sort of a at times what I would describe as sort of a half-hearted effort or an effort that's more interested in other things other than being as good at football as it can possibly be. And when they were happy to take the checks but not always willing to make the same commitment to excellence the SEC made, all of a sudden now when you look at the problems facing college football and the fact that it's almost untenable for the SEC and portions of the Big Ten to compete with these other leagues because it's so obvious these other leagues are inferior – the reason why some of the, the gap exists and the inferiority exists between certain leagues and the, and, and the top leagues, uh, the Premier League overall, the SEC, it's because programs that could have done better were content not to. They were lazy in some respects, or they were interested in peripheral issues. I mean, USC and the Pac-12, they would have canceled football for three years in 2020. They've been more than happy to, to not play again for another half decade, it seems. Uh, and 
when you try to explain, well, how do we get here where there is such an imbalance to the point where you can't even agree on a playoff format because the conferences are so different? The fact that programs within some of these leagues that could have tried harder and could have done better, they just didn't. They were just content to, to, to reap the financial benefits that were coming their way without making a very significant contribution to all of that. Now, I'd say that's created kind of a mess for us right now, which there is no easy solution for. If the SEC and the Big Ten ends up breaking away and kind of doing their own thing, or if everybody ends up breaking away and doing their own thing, the lazy athletic departments at certain places that allowed themselves to just take football less seriously than the SEC did, that is going to be, I believe, a big reason why. And I think more attention needs to be paid to the failings of certain athletic departments in keeping pace with what the SEC was willing to do. We'll make that cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. As we wrap up here today, I told you I wanted to give a little love to Jeff Sintel. And if you watch Before the Edges presented by Kroger, you see this. So Jeff made this when he's in the first grade. I've been meaning to show this in the show for a while and just haven't been able to. So it's like one of those like art projects you kind of do when you're in school and you take the triangles, you sort of glue them on there. And I, well, we'll show you kind of an up-close version of this on the uh, screen here in a moment too. But um, it's uh, Lindsey Scott and it's Herschel Walker and it's Buck Ballou. Jeff making this when he was in the first grade and writing his name, Jeffrey. In fact, we have the golden shoe uh, graphic. We'll kind of zoom in for people on this. You can see the signature there for Lindsey Scott, Herschel Walker, Buck Ballou. Jeff is telling me the story about how this came together, that his first grade teacher, who was a big supporter of UGA, after Jeff had made the art project in the first grade, got the real signatures of all these guys. What an amazing thing that is. If you see Before the Hedges, you've seen that before, but wanted to give uh, Jeff a golden shoe for just one of the coolest things I've ever seen. A, cool because of it's really a kind of a fun art project here. Neat to see Jeff signing his name, Jeffrey, as a first grader. And how about the teacher who, and how many of us have these great stories of wonderful teachers in our lives, and maybe no better example than this, takes Jeff's artwork, gets it signed by Lindsey Scott, Herschel Walker, and uh, Buck Ballou. That's really, really cool stuff. That's in our studio, and Jeff puts that as a part of uh, Before the Hedges each week. So I wanted to give Jeff a little love as a part of a uh, golden shoe here today. And we hope you all have a – oh, by the way, Gator Hater Updater, too. I'm so happy about this. I almost forgot the most important part we got to make fun of those lousy, stinking Gators. 1,210 days. That's how long it's been since they have beaten Georgia. That is always good news. And with that, we'll send you to your weekend. Dog Nation Daily presented by Kroger. We'll see you Monday, everybody. And on video. Time now for the R.S. Andrews cool down. R.S. Andrews, when you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. In the middle of the off season, 72 minutes for really no reason at all. Just a very, very fun and long show here today. But, uh, We'll dive into your comments here right now. So hope all of you are doing good. And uh, I'm going to start on YouTube here today because I do have those comments already pulled up. Or at least I did. Let's see if I can get these back now. Where'd they go? That's kind of weird. Let's see. There, there they are. All right, here we go. Let's see what folks got going over here. UGA boy for life Brunetti. We had a lot of NFL talk in the uh, chat here lately. I think a lot of that's just due to kind of the draft taking place. By the way, I am pro Justin Fields to Atlanta. Uh, put me on the Justin Fields bandwagon. Uh, Baggins and Friends says it's called afternoon tea. Is that my second lunch? Kind of an afternoon tea, maybe so. Uh, Foster Moss also pointing out that I'm wearing the cardigan. Yeah, uh, BA's cardigan. I don't know if he's in our comment section today, but uh, this is the official cardigan of BA's cardigan fame. Um, Uh, Frank Patterson says, uh, you may have covered it, but uh, how did you feel about Matt Luke leaving Georgia to, go, to be with his family, only go back to Clemson? So I'm a cynical person by nature. I would say that cynicism does not typically serve one well, and I would say that my cynicism oftentimes doesn't serve me well. But no matter what I may have said on the show, hopefully I didn't flat-out lie about it, but uh, no matter what I may have said on the show privately, I never believed that Matt Luke was never going to coach again. I just didn't. So... um, um you know, I, and I think that's fair to him. I mean, you could have been burned out for a while, and now you've been away from the game for a little bit. Like, I, I saw Matt a couple of times, uh, you know, just around Athens after he kind of let go of coaching, and he seemed like he's like the happiest guy in the world. And uh, I don't know him or anything. I just say I just would see him around campus a little bit. And he just seemed like he was really enjoying life, go to baseball games, things like that. And, listen, you kind of do that for a little while. You probably get the necessary recharge that you need, but, you know, we are wired to work. Uh, you know, there is always going to be a little bit of a, of an internal tension when you're not working. Something about that's just not right. Human beings are wired to work, I believe. 
And we don't really want that to be true, but it, it kind of is true. So eventually you sort of just sort of gravitate back towards work. And that's what Matt Luke's doing here right now. He's at Clemson. I don't, I don't have any ill will for him. Um, I'm actually sort of amazed. Like I was looking at this the other day. So in college football, it's just sort of assumed that after some sort of crazy thing happens to you, um, you kind of take some time off. Like, you know, Dan Mullen, time ends at Florida. Like he goes and lives on the lake. And we would all say, yeah, even if we like making fun of Mullen, don't particularly like Dan. You can understand why a guy like that would just want to unplug, for, un- unplug from it all for a little while. In the NFL, it's amazing to me how this just doesn't really happen. The version of Matt Luke where it's like, man, I went through this crazy stuff at Ole Miss, came here to Georgia, was a part of that grind. I'm sort of ready to not do it for a while. Like, that's just a very natural thing that happens in college football. But in the NFL, it doesn't happen at all. Like, Arthur Smith, who had a very strange tenure, I'd say, as Falcons head coach, probably pretty stressful. Like, he gets fired. Five days later, he's like the offensive coordinator of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Like, they just jump right into a new job and a much lesser job. And not only does Smith seemingly not need the money because he just was a head coach, doesn't he have, like, generational wealth from his family or something like that? Like, but he just sort of – maybe it is what I said before. Maybe you're just sort of wired to work. But I'm always amazed that NFL coaches don't do more of this, where college coaches, almost like the politician that loses the election, they just sort of go underground for a while. Um, College coaches just sort of do that. After kind of a rocky tenure to job – I'm not saying that Luke's was rocky, but it's hard work being offensive line coach at Georgia. Uh, You just sort of go underground for a while, then you come back, you know, tanned, rested, and ready for your next next run at things. And so I never believed that Luke would never coach again. Never believed that, not for one second. Um, Let's see what else. I got a little bit of Lad McConkey. All right, let's do a little bit of uh, Lad McConkey here. I'm being told from our uh, control room. Uh, so Lad McConkey uh, from the NFL draft uh, combine, scouting combine in Indianapolis. Lad hoping to perhaps even work his way into perhaps the first round, depending on how fast he can run here. Let's hear a little bit from Lad discussing all of those topics and more here for a moment. Um, this week I know I haven't done any for- uh, formal with them. Yeah, uh, I feel like I'm a, I'm a guy that can kind of play, like you said, a little bit everywhere. I think I've had like double the snaps outside the, than I did inside in college. So, um, but I feel comfortable in both positions. I think I can win on the outside and inside. Yeah, no, he was he again. He was a great coach. Um, he did a lot for me. He gave me a chance um, that that second year, and uh, I mean, one one two natties together. So it, it was a special time. So um, yeah, to be able to reunite with him, it, it'd really be it'd be cool. So. Um, he's a great coach, great person, um, and I mean they had a good good year this past year as well. So, yeah, um, I really think that like when it comes to like competing, um, I'm I'm out compete you, I'm out work you. Um, I mean I think I can I can run routes, I can I can play on the outside, inside, special teams. I think I'm very versatile um, and can do a little bit of everything. So. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, the guys in this draft class are, are ridiculous. We have some, some great receivers. But when it comes to doing a little bit of everything, I think I uh, can stand up there with all of them. What is it? Yeah, it's just, it's just another chance, you know, get in front of all these coaches, all these GMs, and, and show them what I'm about. So I um, have a good outing tomorrow on the field work. I'm hopeful I've, I've done well in the interviews. Um, so, yeah, just just build on it. It's really interesting that you hear from Lad McConkey there, and somebody mentioned the other day about you know what happens when you hear the answer, you don't hear the question. You're kind of like going back and trying to figure out, okay, what was the question? I believe Lad got a question there a moment ago about being reunited with Todd Munkin, perhaps in Baltimore. Uh, Munkin, obviously, an offensive coordinator that really knew how to use Lad McConkey well. You know, would that perhaps be in the cards for him to be maybe picked up by John Harbaugh and the Baltimore Ravens? Obviously, Lamar Jackson, and really the story of Jackson's career has been the fact that he hasn't always had the wide receiver help that he's needed, you know, maybe someone like Lad McConkey could be that. That's uh, that's pretty fun stuff there. And uh, you go to the Dog Nation YouTube page, you can see Lad McConkey in addition to all of the other uh, combine interviews taking place there from Indianapolis. Uh, let us see uh, what else. Miriam Corbin says that she heard that Herschel Walker is going to be on Survivor this season. Everybody's ever built to be a survivor. That's Herschel Walker. Unbelievable physical condition. He continues to be. And uh, pretty amazing stuff. Um, 
Ryan Walker. See, so apparently I mentioned like the generational wealth, and this is what I thought was true. So um, is it is right? Arthur Smith's dad founded FedEx. That's 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 amazing. That's amazing. That, that really is pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, so everybody yeah, kind of chiming in there on that. Uh, Jenny Chastine also checking in to say good morning. Uh, Jenny, I'm glad you're here. Good morning to you there as well. Happy to have you as a part of our program here today. Uh, Ulysses Dunning is getting ready to go back to work. Appreciate that. Uh, George Herndon thinks that McConkie is going to be a gem for some team. I would agree with that. I believe that's probably true. Let's see what else on the Facebook side of things. Um, uh, William Camacho says it's been 1,210 days since we lost a regular season game. Yeah, he mentioned that yesterday. What an amazing stat that is. Uh, uh, Bill Sanders, going back we said a moment ago, that the SEC's marketing slogan says, it just means more. Obviously, we know that's true. And as I was saying, the problem is, is it has meant so much more than other, other programs and other leagues that the willingness of these other leagues just to sort of get by and not try as hard as they could. I mean, you know, Southern-based ACC teams could have gotten more of their fair share of the players if they just worked a little harder. North Carolina, Miami, Florida State. I mean, we think of Florida State as being a power program, but even under Mike Norvell right now, this is a team that's sort of barely cracking the top ten in high school recruiting in most cases. And prior to Norvell, they were essentially non-existent. You know, uh, the weird stuff at the end of the Jimbo Fisher era, whatever the program became after that. Like, they just weren't trying hard enough. Miami has been more than content to, I don't know what, like live in the past and dream about Jimmy Johnson and Dennis Erickson, just not trying hard enough. Texas, USC, programs like that also kind of below the Sun Belt. You know, close access to proxy. You know, until this year, Texas hadn't won the Big 12 since 2009. You're just not trying hard enough. If that's the case, you're Texas and you were content to just sort of be one of the teams in the big 12. And part of the reason why college football has its problems is, you know, some of these non sec teams, they just don't try as hard as they could. And we're supposed to sort of pretend that's not the case or, or make things seem like, you know, what they are. A lot of these programs, I mean, to be honest, they hide behind their academics and, I'm not saying the academics are not important, but in this particular case, we're talking about football. And, you know, their explanation for the gap between them and the SEC was always, well, you know, the SEC, these are football factories. They don't care about anything but football. But in this particular case, it's all we're talking about. This is football. Now, if you want to talk about books, we can talk about books. But if we're talking about football, you know, using academics as an excuse for not competing or not being as – committed to the competitions you could have been, I mean, I think we see the end results of all that now. And in a few years, you know, guys might not be students anyway. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Ryan Walker brings up something here that makes me realize we did not do something on the show today that I intended to do. Uh, Ryan writes in to say, I know we uh, the, the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, but I had Eddie, uh, uh, is it, Mecca Shan, is how you say that? On my podcast, I do on YouTube, The Birdcage, LLC. The first African-American to play in the Southeast, and fortunately he's a Yellow Jacket, was also cool to have a legendary figure on. What an amazing thing, Ryan. I appreciate you telling us this, and uh, you want to throw in a link. Folks can go uh, check that out, and I'll go try to f find that myself. I'm, I know your love of history, and that is obviously an incredible piece of history, so I'm really glad you were able to have that conversation. And you know, as someone who's obviously a little too young to have understood that, you know, when you go back and get a chance to, to to watch video from that era and some of the documentaries that have existed, you realize, I mean, it takes a courageous stand to be the first of anything. It does, whatever that first is. And these sort of trailblazers in that category are, are truly very courageous people. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, and also, as you mentioned, the, uh, the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, I'm forgetting here that we did not pay love earlier to what I intended to do today, and I apologize for this. A uh, good Georgia baseball this weekend uh, with its series against Georgia Tech. Now, years ago, Georgia and Georgia Tech used to play a few times during the midweek portion of the baseball season. I love it now that they play all of their games all right here together in sort of a traditional college baseball weekend format. Tonight, you're at Russ Chandler Stadium at Georgia Tech. Saturday, you're in Athens at Foley Field. Sunday, you're at Cool Ray Field there where the Gwinnett Stripers typically play. And how about this on Saturday? And I told my son about this. He's so mad. 
because he has a baseball game on Saturday, can't go to the the, the George George Tech game. But I told him that Harry Dog, they were going to give away a Harry Dog bobblehead of Harry Dog swinging the bat. Like, how cool does that look like? Now, this is not a plug. I'm giving this away free here. But um, uh, uh, Harry Dog swinging the bat, that bobblehead being given away at Foley Field on Saturday. My son, so disappointed to hear that was the giveaway at the stadium and he wasn't going to be able to go to the game. Um, that is a really cool giveaway and a fun thing to do for a really fun thing. Georgia, Georgia Tech and baseball is a really fun deal, concluding that at Cool Ray Field there on Sunday. So, obviously, best of luck to the Diamond Dogs. Hot start to the season. A little bit of a rough game for whatever reason against a, frankly, pretty bad Michigan State team. I really don't know what the story was for the for the sort of, you know, kind of bad loss for Georgia against the Spartans, but Charlie Condon didn't have three home runs. And so uh, that's the story going into this weekend. Both Georgia and Georgia Tech, I think, trying to figure out the pitching here a little bit. Um, but Charlie Condon among the very best players in the country, literally. And uh should be a fun weekend. Atlanta tonight, Athens Saturday, and then Cool Ray Field there in Gwinnett County on Sunday. Um uh, Oh, yeah, so Ryan Walker is also uh, – his godfather's Clarence K. You remember him as the uh, former Denver Bronco and also former Georgia Bulldog. He says he's coming on March 28th, got to have the dog on BA. I mean, yeah, I'd love to do that, Ryan. I would love to do that. Uh, absolutely, that would be a lot of fun. Well, maybe we can connect over that because I would enjoy that very much. Foster Moss wants me to leave the baseball team alone. Listen, I'm not trying to like uh, – I'm not hyping anything up. I'm, I'm certainly not going to be – guilty of doing anything that I could be accused of jinxing later on, but I am interested in the series. Uh, I am interested in the series. Uh, let's see what else. Nature Gator says no Mike White talk today. You know, listen, uh, we've been honest about this. We were disappointed with how this season sort of working out. Now, I do think that Mike White has made Georgia basketball better than it was, I, I think. Uh, the problem is, is they had a long way to go. Uh, so, I mean, I don't mind telling you, you know, you watch what South Carolina is doing this year, as a, for instance. You know, this idea that it's impossible to, you know, be a tournament team, it's impossible to win games when you're not really expected to do so. I, I would say that next year, Georgia basketball needs to have drastic improvement. Now, Florida may say, well, that's not going to happen because you got Mike White as your coach. Y'all may turn out to be right about this. But, listen, you know, given what Georgia basketball was before he got here, I do think that White has been an upgrade problem is the upgrade that Georgia fans want probably still kind of a long way away from that uh and no Frank Patterson I'm not jinxing the baseball team I'm just saying that they're playing uh I'm, we're not bathing ourselves in you know paraphernalia here we're just we're just saying that the, the, the game is taking place so I cannot be uh I cannot be accused of jinxing them um George on tap says that uh um might have been talking about Brian McClendon in Tampa Bay. I guess you could be. I guess that could be the the case. Although I was thinking that when he talks about working with him for two years, uh, yeah, maybe that could have been McClendon because he was also here in twenty twenty two. You could be right. Could be right. Um, you could be right about that. Let's see what else is going on on the YouTube side of things. Morgan Forrest is the Steelers. We're going to get some cheap shipping now, courtesy of FedEx, which is very funny. Um, by the way, I also think I think that Arthur Smith sort of coached like a Nepo baby a little bit. Um, I never liked it. And this is one of those deals where one of the reasons why I like sports betting is because it's a reminder that nobody really knows anything, that all of us – are doing good to get more than 50% of whatever our predictions are. All of us are doing good to get more than 50% right. Pretty much everything over the time sort of gravitates back to about a 50-50 split in what you're right about and what you're wrong about. And that's pretty much true for anybody. Um, so a lot of us then are understanding that our logic is somewhat limited or kind of left to emotion. And in sports, there are just guys you like and guys you don't. Let me give you an example. I always really liked Mike Smith, former Falcons coach. Good dude, I thought. Really rooted for him. And given the opportunity to, to extend the benefit of the doubt, when it came to Mike Smith, I was more than happy to do that. I really liked Mike Smith. I really liked Dan Reeves. Not everybody's cup of tea. 
I always really liked Dan Reeves. Once again, if it's a, if it's a split of you could be in favor of him or against him, I'd kind of find myself, you know, now by the end they probably needed to move off of him. But just sort of I just kind of liked him, right? I never liked Art Smith. Never wanted to give him a chance. Never wanted to – he just came across – I told you yesterday I thought the Falcons were an arrogant organization. Arthur Smith came across as an arrogant coach. He tried to exist as if he didn't have anything to prove. And I guess if you live in some castle, the likes of which the FedEx founder probably lives in, maybe you don't think you have anything to prove. Um, but if you want to actually roll up your sleeves and do some real work, you know, your background and whatever golden spoon, you know, you were born with doesn't help you in that, in that world at all. Uh, it's about your own abilities. And uh, Smith tried to pretend that that he wasn't going to be evaluated the same way anybody else was. He tried to act as if he was a finished product and a uh, known commodity when he's just some guy they pulled off the street. I mean, there are offensive coordinators who get promoted to head coach all the time, and they flame out just as quickly as Arthur Smith did. And so I always felt like there was a certain uh, unearned hubris that Arthur Smith kind of behaved with and um, – I found that distasteful. I just didn't like him. Didn't like him. Um, and I never really want to give him a chance because I didn't like him. And sometimes it's as simple as that. Uh, let's see what else. UJ Boy for Life wants me to argue with Nature Gator. I'm not I'm not in really an argument mood today. Um, P. Rich, though, does agree with me on Arthur Smith. Yeah, I'm just telling you. Look, a lot of sports is just the emotional reaction that something gives you. Because go, go look at the quarterbacks that get drafted. Nobody knows anything. Like, like, like no one is truly capable of, like, leaning into logic and sort of making sense of one thing or not. Everybody just eventually uses your gut. So you can justify your gut with analytics and fancy stats and scouting reports, but eventually it comes down to, what does my gut tell me? And some of us have more prodigious guts than others. Uh, what does my gut tell me about Arthur Smith? He ain't him. Uh, and uh, that ultimately came to be true. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Morgan Ford. So I said this earlier. This, this is not a controversial statement. Do, do y'all not do this? When it's raining, you can't sit outside, so you sit in the garage. People have garage beers all the time. It's a thing that exists. If you're going to have a garage beer, why couldn't you have a garage ready-to-drink cocktail? Why, why, why couldn't you do that? Uh, you, know, you pop the top on a can of beer, you could pop the top on a can of the finished long drink. And for whatever reason, like when I'm sitting in the garage, if you've ever had one of those experiences with friends or something like that, like sad country music just is, that, that's just what sounds like nine, some you know, 90s sad country music. In the garage with the rain coming down, like, that's awesome. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Um, that that's a that's a very very good thing. Um, Morgan Forrest says it's the old country. People do, people do this. This is an accepted form of entertainment. You sit around, you listen to some old sad country music. There's nothing better than that. And here's the thing. You don't have to be sad to listen to sad country music. It's a very important thing to understand in life is that sad country music is just sort of its own genre. And sometimes you listen to it and you're like, I'm glad I'm not as bad as this dude in the song is. Um, uh, like you, just because you listen to sad country music, that does not mean that you are sad. Uh, Nature Gator says that he prefers to have fun unless I go low uh, on his gators. Uh, listen, I would never. Never take a cheap shot at Florida. I, I, I would I would never do anything like that. Uh, but some of y'all act like you'd, you know, you'd never listen to some sad country music in the garage. I'm just telling you right now, that is, like, you've really, I feel like you've really missed out on that if you haven't done that. Um, Alan Hampton asked an interesting question. He says, can anybody besides Trippy, Walker, Champ, Bowers be labeled freak athletes in Georgia football? Well, you got to put Heinz Ward on there. I mean, Heinz Ward, if you're just doing sort of pound for pound football ability, football player, you know, Heinz Ward, like from a sort of a tangible accomplishment standpoint, probably less so than, like I say, a Champ Bailey. Champ became a you know first round pick. Ward, I believe, was a third round pick. 
you know, guys like Brock Bowers obviously won a lot more and they're also going to be drafted a lot higher. But Champ played tailback, played quarterback, played, you know, uh, uh, wide receiver, could have played linebacker. Uh, like, if you're just doing, like, drafting a football team, you know, Heinz Ward would have been drafted. It's one of the reasons why people want him as a coach so bad. Um, Heinz Ward would have been drafted far higher than his actual on-field accomplishments. Philip Wells says, sad country music is no different than old-school R&B from the 70s. Both were made for uh, brown liquor drinking. See, there you go. See, Philip understands this. Absolutely understands this. And admittedly, you know, perhaps, you know, playing towards type, I know more about the old country than the old R&B, but I would say it does function pretty much the same way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, oh, so Frank Patterson says Zion Logue ran a 5-1 and a 5-2. Uh, so Zion wanted to break 5. He wanted to run a 4-9, I think. For those of you who more draft mix than I am. What does a 5-1 and a 5-2 mean for Zion Logue? I guess I'll have a chance to improve on that at the pro day. I mean, it's clearly what, what uh, uh, Jordan Davis ran like a 4-7-7 or something like that or something crazy like that uh, or whatever it was that Davis ran. Um, what does it mean for uh, Zion Logue that that's what he ran? Uh, Paul Moon says, I don't know if Pollock was a special athlete, but he was a great player. Yeah, I mean, David Pollock is on my Mount Rushmore – I think what uh, Alan was talking about is something a little bit different, more along the lines of the sort of just sort of wow factor athletes. Charles Grant would be on that discussion. Charles Grant would absolutely be in that discussion. Grant was a very good running back in high school for sure, and some at Georgia there as well. Charles Grant, if you're doing the um, like the Georgia freaks, Charles Grant would be on that. Lance, see, I, I knew some of y'all were cultured. Lance D says, when you play some old Waylon Jennings, you can literally taste the whiskey through the speaker. See, there you go. That's a good rainy weekend activity. Uh, a very good. And there's, no, there's no football on. Uh, you know, put a little, you know, college basketball on a TV and sit out in the garage. Have yourself a beverage. Listen to some sad country, some, you know, some stuff like that. That's great. Some Keith Whitley. You know, you know how good Keith Whitley sounds in a garage? great the acoustics sort of made for that uh lee underwood says who's the sleeper georgia draftee we're gonna get ready to leave in a minute uh because our people want to go home i'm sure the sleeper georgia draftee if i had to say i would probably say i mean relative to where he's going to be drafted I, I, I would see it being javon bullard that's another guy that's going to probably be kind of picked apart a little bit by what he runs like but, y'all, I mean, Javon Bullard wasn't even on Georgia's radar until he sent a bunch of videos in. He's like, you know, he's like sending a demo tape. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, just pushing this stuff on Georgia during the during the COVID year. Um, and so, I mean, if anybody's got, like, the kind of wiring to sort of succeed in a situation like this, I'd put it on Bullard, especially relative to where I think he might get drafted. I believe that's probably the case. Uh, who else? That really kind of counts as a true sleeper. Is there a better name than that? Uh, Morgan Forrest says Tyke. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. I mean, I we talked earlier about Tyke. Uh, you know, kind of about what he sort of overcame just to even have a spot at Georgia. So perhaps that's kind of the same thing. Um, Paul Moon says about Bullard. You know, maybe too small to play as big as he does. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those deals where, and I know this is an oversimplification. I I, I do understand that, but. The thing that I scream about all the time is, is like, you have no control over whether or not you're right on a decision. If you're an NFL personnel man, you have really no control. Go back and look at the few years ago. It's like, Trevor Lawrence, are we sure he's a good quarterback? The BYU kid that went to the Jets, we're pretty sure he's not a good quarterback. You know, on and on you could go with the quarterbacks in that draft. They're all, you know, pretty bad, right? And, and, there's, it's all just a guesswork. So for me, it comes down to, if it's all just a guessing game anyway, what story do I want to tell myself when I'm wrong? And the story I would want to tell myself if I was an NFL GM, I'm going to draft guys who made plays in big games in college. Who knows who's right and who's wrong and who knows who pans out and who doesn't, but the thing that I would use is not how fast they ran at the combine, but it's when a national championship is at stake, are you capable of separating Marvin Harrison Jr. from football? And that's what that's what I'd want. And 
I would just base my evaluations on making plays in games that matter. Production in high-level football games, I just make my bet on that. And really, I kind of do the same thing for high school guys there too. And I realize that, you know, not everybody plays in the same, you know, kind of like landscape in high school football. So you probably have to lean on some of the the measurables maybe a little bit more. But you better believe when we're talking about so-and-so maybe come to Georgia, you know, Jeff mentioned C.J. Wiley a little earlier. You're making plays on a 7A state champion. That's going to earn a little bit of extra credit for me. Now, that alone is probably not enough to – to prove anything, but if it's all being equal between this guy who, you know, putting up numbers in big football games and -and so-and-so somewhere else who's, you know, just ran fast on, on a, uh, at a camp one time, I'd rather have the guy that's making plays in games. I would. And in the NFL draft, I would absolutely stake my job. Cause if you don't pick the right guys, you're gonna get fired. Um, I would stake my job on, Give me guys who made plays and were productive in high-level football games. Uh, Morgan Forrest on the Brock Bowers stuff. Yeah, I don't know what Bowers has said about that as of yet. I'm not not sure. Uh, I know he was kind of in between on that. And if you're not fully committed when the week begins, it means you're probably not doing it. My guess is that Bowers is going to mostly save his stuff for uh, for the pro day, which will be here before you know it. Back on Facebook again. And then we're going to get ready to go. Alan Verbonchik, uh laughing about what happens when you play a country song backwards. You've heard this joke before. You know, you, you get your ex back, your dog comes back to life, your truck. <laughs> yeah. You heard that joke before. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, uh, uh, some of these I'm not sure if I can read. Uh, Keith Lamb, uh, Hank Williams Jr., that's another good one. Yeah, another uh, awesome. Hurrah. Awesome garage audience. Some of y'all need to go out in the garage. Whatever listening device you use, don't use earbuds. Let let that thing just play and listen to the way the some of that '70s country, kind of like the acoustics in a garage for some of that '70s country. I'm just telling you right now, it's not gonna get any better than that. It's not gonna get better than that. Um, it's not gonna get better than that. Let's see what else. Oh, yeah, Miriam Corbin, how about this? Uh, uh, listening to Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and Allman Brothers. There you go. There you go. I can see that being pretty good, too. All right, back on dognation.com. Scott Harris, see, I get criticized for not coming back to the Dog Nation comment section. I feel like I've been bouncing around. Um, L.A. Dog asks an interesting question. So l- l- let's pause on this for a moment before it gets too late. He says, are you suggesting that these other uh, these other programs invested more than there would have been more parity the last 20 years and thus less conference realignment? I think I am suggesting that. And, look, I believe that college football would be on better footing right now if Texas and Oklahoma were still in the Big 12 and if USC and UCLA were still in the Pac-12. And I believe that those leagues would have remained more viable if they just performed – like the power conference teams were supposed to. Like, why does the ACC have such a smaller, I don't want to say footprint because that's geography, smaller reputation than the SEC does? It was not supposed to be that way. When the, when the ACC started expanding, they were bringing on Miami, and this is shortly after Miami had been one of the greatest teams of all time in, like, say, the early, very early 2000s. Florida State. You know, you were thought, oh, you know, Virginia Tech was kind of a uh, a little bit of a fixture in the top 25. The ACC, when it first started doing all this expansion, it had reason to believe that it could compete alongside the SEC. It just never happened. The reason why it never happened is Miami just sort of forgot how to have a football team. And I think they have weird administration, and I think they have sort of, when it comes to athletics, sort of weird priorities. And now there's sort of a plaything for a, relatively mercurial booster, but they didn't try hard enough. They, they they weren't focused on being as committed to winning as the SEC is. If they were, the ACC would have had a better TV deal. Part of the reason why the ACC has such a rotten TV deal is because that's all the league deserved because teams like Florida State went a long time without being competitive. Uh, Miami is essentially still uncompetitive. Um, you know, 
I don't know what North Carolina and Virginia and schools like that. I'm not even sure what they even want. Um, um, so, yeah, if these other programs – I mean, think about the University of Virginia. University of Virginia couldn't squash a grape in football. But geographically, they're not that far away from, like, Hampton Roads and Tidewater and all these places in Virginia where real legitimate talent comes from. Georgia goes to Maryland to get players. Um, if Georgia can go to Maryland to get players, I mean, that's a bus ticket from, uh, you know, from, from Charlottesville – Virginia wouldn't dare, you know, dirty their hands by, you know, going and recruiting real football players, you know, in their own state. They just don't do that. They they, they want to be, you know, something fancier than that or something. I don't, I don't even know, you know, how you describe that. But it's like if if Virginia, if North Carolina, if Miami, if Clemson, if Florida State, if they were really trying as hard as the very best teams in the SEC have tried – and the ACC would just feel different, and you wouldn't need to separate yourself from it because it's so inferior. If Texas, I said this before, Texas hasn't won the Big 12 until this year since 2009. Like how many times have we laughed about Texas being back? Well, Texas should have been back. It's Texas. And the same way that the SEC leaned on its own in-state talent and its border state talent to, to build rosters, Texas should have been doing that. Instead, all of these Big 12 teams get infatuated by the spread offenses and not playing any defense and – yeah, so the simple answer to a very, I think, good question is is if these teams that had more resources that just weren't properly using them, if they if they would have all just been a little bit more focused on competing at the same – see, they always wanted to turn their nose up the SEC, all these rednecks, football factories. But, but now they sort of wish they would have played a little harder over the course of time, and they're essentially – it's up, now, Texas is not. They're in the SEC. But a lot of these programs that, you know, thought the SEC was wrong for trying as hard as it did, it just means more they sort of scoffed at that. Now they realize that the sport is almost irreconcilably severed because of the fact that the the results and the, and the interest and the just willingness to compete are just so separate. Uh, there you go. As we get ready to wrap up here today, there's my long drink. There's my garage. Now, we know this is not my garage because there are bicycles up there, and there ain't no way in the world I'm going to be a bicyclist. Uh, but that's the kind of garage that some 70s music would just sound great in. I mean, that would just sound so good. 70s country, some sad Keith Whitley, some Waylon Jennings, Hank Jr. That's it right there. That's a great weekend. Finished long drink, little blue can, traditional, grapefruit flavor. I'm telling you right now, that's it. That's it. On a, on a cold, rainy weekend like this, doesn't get any better. Well done by the folks back there on that. Hey, uh, if your you know garage is not working the way it's supposed to because there's like plumbing or electricity issues, our friends at RS Andrews get you covered on all that. You can uh, find them online, rsandrews.com. Water heater goes out. They'll fix it for you the same day. Like I said, you got some sort of plumbing issue that's kind of making it difficult to enjoy your garage time this weekend. Hey, RS Andrews is going to get you covered on all that, too. And I know our buddy Dari Payro. I guarantee you our buddy Dari Payro is listening to some sad country music in a garage at some point. In time. There's no doubt in my mind he's done that. So y'all check out RS Andrews online, rsandrews.com. Have a great weekend in the garage or not. We'll see you back here Monday, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Kroger. We'll look forward to talking to you then.